Olá, boa noite. Estamos no ar em todo o país pela TV Cultura, pelas emissoras afiliadas, pela Rádio Cultura Brasil, pelo portal UOL, pelo portal da cultura no cmais.com.br jornalismo. Hoje, nossa bancada de entrevistadores é composta por Ciro Piron, de arquiteto urbanista e diretor da Escola da Cidade, Fernando Schuller, cientista político e curador do projeto Fronteiras do Pensamento, Sabine Riguete, repórter de Ciência e Educação do Jornal Folha de São Paulo e autora do blog Abecedário. E João Sete Whittaker, urbanista, professor e coordenador do Laboratório de Habitação da Faculdade de Arquitetura e Urbanismo da USP. Também está conosco Ulisses Capozoli, editor-chefe da revista Scientific American Brasil. Como de costume, contamos também com os desenhos feitos em tempo real pelo nosso cartunista Paulo Caruso. Mas como o programa de hoje é gravado, não teremos a interação com os telespectadores nem os twitteiros convidados aqui no estúdio. No dia em que gravamos este programa, o apresentador do Roda Viva, Augusto Nunes, teve imprevisto que o impossibilitou de estar no comando do Roda Viva, por isso, excepcionalmente, eu estarei mediando o programa. Professor West, eu queria começar... Acho que é uma questão básica, né? É, a gente é, tem uma perspectiva de em 2050, 75% da população mundial é, estar nas cidades, concentrada nas cidades. É, na sua teoria, quanto maiores as cidades, mais eficientes elas são. É, e isso parece um pouco misterioso para quem vive numa cidade como São Paulo, onde a gente vive, e nas grandes cidades latino-americanas, com tantos problemas. E a gente culpa muito o tamanho das nossas cidades por esses problemas. Como é possível a, a, a pensar isso, que nós teremos cidades maiores e mais eficientes? Sim, bem boa noite e obrigado por me me. Sim, eu acho que foi uma visão tradicional das cidades for a very long time that um, many of the problems are because of the size of the cities, the great big cities that developed in the 19th century and then into the 20th century. Um, there was this image of, um, you know, a, a, a dark alien place uh, um, with uh, people struggling for existence and uh, living in poverty and pollution and so on. And of course, there was that, and there still is that. And um, uh, you know, Sao Paulo has its version of that. Nevertheless, the, I think the, one of the surprising things, possibly, that uh, people began to recognize um, with uh, a deeper study of cities, and certainly in the work that I've been involved in, is the um, <coughs> discovery, if you like, that systematically, The bigger the city, the more efficient it is, as you remarked, um, in a systematic way uh, within a given urban system. So if you take the urban system of Brazil or the urban system of the United States, um, as the, as the um, uh, cities grow and as they, if you look at one city versus another in terms of size, then systematically the bigger city has greater efficiency in the following sense that um, you need, for example, less gasoline stations per capita, you need less roads per capita, and in general you need less infrastructure per capita. And uh, at the same time, um, if you look at average wages, the average kind of productivity, um, the average number of patents produced, meaning the average number of ideas produced per city, these increase in a systematic way. Uh, but this is on the average, so it, it doesn't say that, um, you know, everybody goes up with the size of the city because there are always winners and losers, but on the average, uh, bigger cities have this greater efficiency and this greater reward, but that greater reward can also come in terms not just of good things, but in terms of bad things, because also, it is also true that the bigger the city in a systematic way, Uh, typically, the more crime, the more pollution, and the more disease. Okay. Você so, so, uh, trabalha com equações físico-matemáticas para levantar, digamos, os fundamentos da cidade, apontar caminhos de, corra, de correção, de inovação. Mas nesse momento, eu acho que em escala global nós vivemos uma crise da política, a ciência de gerir a polis. Nós temos um problemas sérios de corrupção no Brasil e fora. Uh, tem uma baixa eficiência, uma baixa sensibilização para as questões pessoais. 
Ah, ainda que o senhor forneça o instrumento, digamos, de correção da cidade, como é que nós podemos pensar a crise política, essa da, da ciência de gerir a polis da cidade? Sim, yeah, so, um, of course, trying to put politics into the equation, which of course is a critical part of uh, understanding cities, urbanization, and the whole question of quality of life, and, uh, and, and ultimately the whole question of the sustainability of cities, but more generally the sustainability of the entire socioeconomic system that has evolved. Um, this, of course, is, in, is, is extremely difficult, and I would say possibly even impossible to put in as you started your question in terms of, you know, a mathematical formula, uh, so to speak. Um, but um, an important thing to recognize, which is sort of amazing in a way, is that um, in terms of the multiple metrics that um, one can measure, the quantities that you can measure about cities, um, so that you can put a number to them, um, as the things I mentioned a moment ago, length of all the roads, number of gas stations, the average wages, number of patents produced, the amount of crime, the amount of pollution, mm -hmm. but all the various things that you can measure, all of these, as I said, um, obey a simple mathematical equations in terms of their relationship to the size of the city, the size of the city being, say, defined by its population. But what is also amazing about it is that this is at the 80 to 90 percent um, independent of, in fact, the history, geography, and culture, and therefore, over t an, a large enough time scales, independent actually of the politics. So the practitioners and politics. So the 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 effect that um, policy can have is actually limited to 10 to 20 percent of what's actually happening in the city. So there is a, a um, underlying hidden dynamic that is associated with the city, which is, um, uh, and maybe I, I can talk about this later, is um, a, a reflection of the social networks that are the true part of a city. That is, it is the people that define the city and the, what we normally think of as the city, namely the infrastructure, the roads, the houses, the buildings, uh, the, the transportation systems in general, um, these are actually um, secondary in some sense to the dynamics of interaction among people. And uh, because the, uh, and, and in fact, really going to the heart of your question, we have invented cities, so to speak. One of our great discoveries as human beings was the invention of cities in order to facilitate interaction of people, to create ideas, to, to innovate, to create wealth, and to improve the social well-being um, and quality of life and standard of living of people. So, um, so on the one hand, you're, of course, right in your question that somehow how can we integrate politics or political decisions into it, nevertheless we have this cushion, so to speak, that at 80-90% think there is a dynamic that transcends politics. And I would only add to that that I think an important aspect of the future of cities, because they play this critical role in the future of the planet, is that we in fact at a minimum have much more dialogue between politicians, policy makers, urban planners and a potential science of cities. O senhor fala das relações sociais, uh, o Brasil é um país que teve uh, a escravidão mais longa do ocidente, 350 anos de escravidão, um pouco mais. As relações sociais ficam comprometidas dentro de uma ordem escravista. Uh, o direito individual, a justiça, uh, a felicidade da família, tudo isso é comprometido. O senhor acha que mesmo com esse ferimento profundo da escravidão, é uma cidade como São Paulo, se ela ainda tem essa margem de manobra para se se, uh, se projetar no futuro? Sim, yeah, so of course, each city and each urban system has its own, uh, in that sense, it has its own unique history and its own legacy of, um, uh, you know, that, that 
aspects like slavery or, I mean, you talk about slavery, of course, um, the United States has a long history of slavery and the, the uh, residue of that um, continues to today. Um, but, um, you know, you could argue that uh, all countries actually had slavery. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it might have been, the, the ethnicity may have been um, uh, uniform, more uniform, but nevertheless, you know, the bulk of the population uh, lived in effect in slavery in many ways. You know, they were enslaved to factories and to their jobs and so forth. Uh, especially in the 19th century and the 20th century, in a certain sense, was a century of potential liberation of both um, uh, people that had the same ethnicity and those that didn't. didn't. So um, we're still living with that. And of course, that is something that goes to the previous question that you asked, and that because these are socio-political questions that need to be integrated into the equation, so to speak, and into developing the, um, the conceptual framework for understanding the evolution and growth of cities and um, each city in that sense. So what I'm interested in actually is more the commonality among cities and um, it, its uh, global implications, but you have to use that as a baseline, the commonality as a baseline for asking about the individuality of a city that does depend upon its history, geography, and culture, and therefore its legacy. And, um, uh, and, and the, the leaders of a city, the mayor, and those that are determining its future and looking to determine a vision for it, it is, the onus is on them, of course, to integrate some of that history and that legacy into the bigger framework. É, eu, sobre, para começar, é, é, eu acho que seria interessante perguntar, é, nós já tivemos no Brasil, no campo do urbanismo, é, vários momentos em que os modelos de, a modelagem matemática era um caminho de interpretação do urbano. Eles, na verdade, ficaram obsoletos pela sua incapacidade de incorporar justamente as dinâmicas pouco mensuráveis, que são as dinâmicas sociopolíticas. É, eu queria, justamente, talvez para começar, perguntar, é, para o senhor, se o senhor podia nos explicar essa equação que o senhor citou, se é que é possível fazê-lo aqui sem uma lousa, assim, mas para a gente entender melhor é, qual é essa equação. Porque a preocupação é, é um modelo, uma equação, ela, de certa forma, é, transforma a ação política dos governantes num é, elemento externo que talvez tenha um poder de influência nessa equação que tem um caráter talvez mais imutável, limitado. Eu gostaria, então, portanto, de entender com é essa equação para depois poder é, avançar um pouco no debate. Eu não sei se é possível explicá-la de maneira simples. Sure. Yes. Yeah, very, I, I'm not sure I can, but I will try. And um, I first, uh, since you brought it up in relationship to political action, just as the previous question is, I want to make a kind of philosophical point. And that is that, um, you know, to address problems and to um, innovate and uh, mitigate uh, situations and make progress, it's critical to understand it, to understand the system. So, um, uh, you know, to, uh, to build an airplane in the beginning, to build an airplane 100 years ago, required very little understanding, it did require some, but very little understanding of hydrodynamics and aerodynamics and the strength of materials and so on. Um, um, and in fact, an airplane was built by the Wright brothers and that revolutionized the planet, basically. But you try building a Boeing 747 without knowing the science and the technology and the engineering, and you will be doomed to failure. You clearly need to really understand what are the principles at work and so on. Now, the Wright brothers knew a little bit, but they weren't scientists, they, were, they weren't really engineers. Um, and so it is that, uh, you know, to build this, you need to understand, you know, the physics, the engineering, and so forth. 
So I'm going to stick my neck out and be provocative and say that to address the questions that involve cities, urbanization, and the sustainability of the planet, it is critical that we first ask the question, is there, in fact, any sense of a science of cities in a mechanistic way in which we can understand them and put them into a mathematizable, computable framework? Now, um, I think the first answer to that is clearly no. That is, there can't be a predictable framework like there is of Newton's laws and the planets going around the sun, which allows us, in fact, to better use this all the time, that we can predict exactly where a satellite is that makes this thing work. But um, so there isn't a predictive framework that I can tell you what Sao Paulo will look like in 10 years, 20 years, or 100 years. But that doesn't mean to say there aren't underlying generic laws at work that are framing what Sao Paulo is as a city of a of the size it is now, how it's in fact has been growing and may proceed to grow, and what are the underlying principles that, that uh, are associated with it. And so the first thing, and I made this comment a moment ago, the first thing is to establish are there any generic, I'll use the word universal, principles or laws that transcend all cities. You know, that all cities somehow obey. So that was, that's kind of the philosophical starting point. And it is shamelessly that of a physicist, of you know, trying to think about it as a system that can be analyzed and we can draw some conclusions and then look at uh, data and see if we can uh, start building a serious theory and how far can that be taken and then ask the question, how does that apply to this particular city? And how does it apply in terms of its relationship to policy and so forth? So now that's the preamble, I'm afraid, to your, to your, uh, your question about can I explain the mathematics of this? So um, what was discovered, um, uh, some of which was known a little bit, was that if you look across cities within a given urban system, from the smallest to the largest, um, each one looking individually different, then in fact, any measurable quantity associated with them, and let's just talk about infrastructure for the moment. Um, so the, as I mentioned a moment ago, the length of all the roads, the number of gas stations, the length of electrical lines, and so forth and so on, that um, these scale in a extraordinarily predictable way over the whole spectrum of sizes from towns of 10 or 50,000 up to towns of 15 million or more. And uh, the, the mathematics translates well uh, into English and therefore into Portuguese <laughs> in, the following, in the following way, that if you double the size of a city within an urban system anywhere in the world, that you save consistently 15% per capita every time you do it. So if you take a city of 100,000 and you compare it or you double it to a size of 200,000 or from 1 million to 2 million or 10 million to 20 million, doesn't matter where, you save 15% in terms of infrastructure. Um, and that's interesting. And by the way, that works essentially the same way that all of life works, all of biology works that way, except the saving in biology is bigger. It turns out it's 25%. When you double the size of an organism, you don't need twice as much energy, which is what you would think you would need, because there's twice as many cells. But in fact, you only need 75%. So there's this 25% savings every time you double, and it doesn't matter where you begin. It doesn't matter where you begin if you double you get this. And so in biology, that is understood. Um, and by the way, that is true across all of life, from cells and across all multicellular organisms, whether trees, plants, mammals, birds, fish, insects, and so on. This law applies. And it applies to any other physiological variable you measure. And uh, the reason for that it turns out, 
uh, underlying it is that um, all of life is sustained by networks, the ones that we are very familiar with, our circuitry system and so on, but there are networks uh, within cells, there are networks in all organisms in order to sustain the 100 million cells that are in our body. We need these networks. And um, it is the mathematics and physics of those networks that are independent of the evolved design. And this is extremely important. It doesn't matter. We are different than a tree, and we're different than an insect. But we both have these network systems, and these network systems have the same mathematics. And so this gets reflected in the laws that govern how life scales from cells up to whales and up to ecosystems. So going back to cities, what we see is that just as in biology, even though the whale lives in the ocean and uh, the elephant has a trunk and the giraffe has a long neck and we walk on two feet, etc., etc., we look completely differently. In fact, at the 85 to 90 percent level, in terms of the quantities that we can measure physiologically, we are scaled versions of one another. So the question then is, is there anything like that among cities? is, well, I won't use Brazil as an example because I'll make a mistake about your, your cities, but I'll use the United States. So is New York um, a scaled up Los Angeles, which is a scaled up Chicago, which is a scaled up Santa Fe, which is where I live, even though they look completely different, they have different histories, different cultures, different geographies, and so on. And the only way you can answer that is looking at the data. So going back to what I said earlier, if you look at all these multiple quantities to do with infrastructure, you find that indeed there is this regular scaling um, uh, for this saving on infrastructure. But what is more surprising and maybe more interesting is that if you look at any socioeconomic quantity, that is a quantity that involves the interaction between human beings, which is new, which is something that is different than occurs in biology, so um, then you find that socioeconomic quantities like wages, like the number of patents produced, that is the number of ideas, if you like, that are produced in a city, um, the number of AIDS cases, uh, um, the amount of crime, all of these things systematically increase by 15% every time you double the city. And that seems to be true um, across the globe for the urban systems where we can get data. And just to make that clear, that's the systems that we have looked at are the um, United States, various European countries, various Latin American countries. I think we've had Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, um, China, Japan. And all of these, these urban systems manifest this same regular pattern of this kind of 15% rule every time you double. <clears throat> and the question is, so that's kind of the, the um, non-mathematical way of saying what it is, but it comes from, we believe, from something that, uh, you know, you ask yourself, how can it be that Brazilian cities scale um, similarly to Japanese cities, because they're completely, you know, they evolve differently and so forth. And uh, we suggest that the reason for that is because you ask yourself, what is common across all these different urban systems? So the main commonality is cities are for human beings. It's human beings, and it is something I referred to earlier. It is, so to speak, the universality of social networks in different cultures. Even though the cultures are different, basically, at this kind of average level, we basically are the same whether we're Japanese, Brazilian, or Americans, um, just in the, in, in, you know, in the sense that we're very familiar. We all have families, we all have jobs, and we all interact socially in those, in, and we interact in a way in which we're part of modular units. And this is pretty universal, and it is the structure, the mathematical structure of those social networks and this makes it more complicated than biology, interacting with the infrastructural networks, the roads and the various transport lines and the electric power lines and so on, Professor that West. gives rise to this scaling. Professor West. 
Eu peço, eu peço só um segundo dia, a gente vai ter que fazer um rapidíssimo intervalo aqui, o assunto é, rende muito e a gente volta já já com o físico Joffrey West. volta com a entrevista com o físico britânico Geoffrey West, que veio ao Brasil para participar do projeto Fronteiras do Pensamento. Tem uma tese que ali a física e biologia para explicar que as cidades maiores se tornam mais eficientes. Nesse segundo bloco, Fernando, gostaria de começar? Exato. É, vou fazer uma pergunta, talvez um pouco na linha do, do que o Ita, que o próprio Ulisses colocou. Evidentemente, o professor Geoffrey West é um físico, né? É, portanto, há um, talvez nos incomode um pouco a ideia de que há uma determinação, ou seja, uma, um viés determinista no progresso, no avanço, enfim, no crescimento das cidades, que guardaria pouco espaço à ação humana, ação política, ação criativa, ação dos urbanistas, enfim. É, o senhor, inclusive, colocou em torno de 20%, 25%, que seria a variável humana né, no progresso das cidades, né, esse ganho de eficiência. Agora, o senhor também enfatiza muito o aspecto da inovação, é? Ao contrário dos organismos vivos, essa analogia, a cidade, o que, que, que crescem e se estabilizam em termos de crescimento, as cidades elas não necessariamente estabilizam, elas podem crescer indefinidamente. Não é? Então, qual é exatamente o papel, da, desde que inovem, não é? se eu bem entendi o seu argumento? É? Então, talvez seria no aspecto inovação, quer dizer, o papel da política, o papel dos urbanistas, dos planejadores urbanos, de um prefeito, por exemplo, da cidade, e como é, é possível acelerar o processo de inovação? Não é? Qual, e de que maneira exatamente a inovação acontece na cidade e pode ser acelerada? E aí talvez né, exista um espaço para a ação humana, vamos dizer assim, no direcionamento do progresso das cidades. Sim, essa é uma pergunta muito boa e uma pergunta crítica, porque as um, cidades, you know, em muitas formas, podem ser pensadas como you know, the, um, as a place, as I mentioned earlier, facilitating interactions. I mean, the great, uh, that's why we've invented them, so to speak, but um, uh, they are kind of this crucible for creating more and more interactions and that um, um, this, this systematic increase is a reflection um, of this 15% value added, so to speak, is a reflection of the increase in interaction between people. And um, the role of a mayor and an administration of a city is um, providing um, a culture, providing um, uh, kind of mechanisms that facilitate interaction, that facilitate entrepreneurship, that uh, facilitate um, people uh, being empowered to um, uh, you know, live uh, creative kinds of lives, meaningful lives. This, of course, is extremely difficult um, in a large city. But um, so um, there has to be methodologies, incentives, that, uh, that, are, that, that provide space and time for um, uh, increasing interaction. And, um, you know, the successful, big successful cities like New York have um, this marvelous feeling when you're there, this kind of buzz that um, where um, you feel people are interacting and doing. And, and I think that translates through the population to a sense of purpose. Um, and so that can be facilitated by city administrations, although its, its actuality uh, has to be put into the construction of public places and so on, but also um, into the private sector that, of course, then helps to ameliorate and uh, provide the continuous feedback mechanisms that give uh, life to a city. So, um, uh, despite the fact that, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that 
the majority of the structure and dynamics of a city are in a certain way constrained already by the interaction among people, by the baseline interaction among people, there is this kind of 10 to 20 percent that, a, uh, that the, the fathers, the leaders of the city uh, can play an, a critical and important role in. And um, I think one of the issues with that, by the way, is that, um, that unfortunately, in terms of the kinds of political systems that we all participate in, timescales of trying to affect change are usually thought of as one to two years, three to four years maximally. But these changes, in terms of creating a greater buzz of a city, a greater feeling of, of, uh, of innovation, a greater feeling of ideas and wealth being created, these in, uh, are things that take 10, 20, even 50 years. So uh, this is a real challenge, I think, for mayors and uh, politicians. Um, and, and of course, they're at the same time inundated with all the small but very important problems of a city, maintaining infrastructure and dealing with you know, uh, the, uh, the in inhomogeneities in a city and so on. But in general, I think that is their role. Their role is to you know, help continue fuel that fire. Professor. É, eu vi um artigo científico do senhor é, de 2010 em que o senhor e seus colegas falam que as cidades tendem a manter é, algumas características, por exemplo, de inovação, de serviços à saúde e até de violência. Então, é, nesse artigo vocês mencionam São você nos Estados Unidos, que já era uma cidade inovadora em 1960, então ela tende a crer, essa inovação tende a crescer no ritmo e os serviços da saúde tendem a crescer no ritmo e a violência também. Eu queria saber, para uma cidade como São Paulo, por exemplo, que é uma cidade caótica, era caótica, continua sendo caótica, é possível, é, pre, é possível ter um elemento disruptivo, ou seja, é possível, de acordo com o seu estudo, com o seu modelo matemático, é possível que uma cidade como São Paulo, de repente, saia desse padrão no qual ela está se encontrando em termos de crescimento e inovação do serviço de saúde e, de repente, as, é, assumir outra característica? Ok. So, yes, that's also a very good question. And I'm, by the way, I'm impressed that you read that paper. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, so, um, so that paper goes to what we were talking about before, um, and it relates very much to what mm -hmm. you're saying, that um, you know, this scaling, this 15%, is the baseline. And then you can ask for a given city um, is it over or underperforming relative to what it should be doing mm -hmm. in terms of its size, given its size? So if you give me the size of a city, say, in the United States, um, from, from this mathematics, you can say, look, it should have um, um, 220 police, it should have 43 AIDS cases, it should have produced 97 patents, and so on. Mm -hmm. But in fact, of course, when you look at it, it deviates a little bit, and so this provides the baseline that is uh, that uh, from which you should assess true performance. You should not assess it just by per capita indices. You should assess it relative to what you expect it to perform, given that it has this social dynamic going on. Mm -hmm. And indeed, the case that you mentioned, San Jose, overperforms in terms of number of patents. Not surprising because San Jose in California is its metropolitan area includes Silicon Valley. So it's not surprising that it's a great leader. But as you point out and we've discovered in that paper, actually San Jose was overperforming in 1960. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to ask yourself, what is it about San Jose? What is it in the DNA, so to speak, of San Jose? What were the city fathers, the, the mayors, and so on, that followed doing that encouraged this and led eventually to uh, the great success of Silicon Valley. Um, and so it is with a city that's deeply underperforming, and you're implying that Sao Paulo is underperforming, maybe, mm -hmm. in terms of um, uh, the various metrics. And I can't speak to that. I'm not, a, you know, I don't, I'm not familiar. Mm -hmm. 
uh, enough with uh, Brazilian urban system or with uh, Sao Paulo, but I would say the following. Um, the scaling curve, um, the, whole, the, the, the overall size of the scaling curve um, is really a manifestation of the entire urban system. It's an average over the urban system. Um, and the deviations are, of course, the individuality and uniqueness of the city, uh, how it deviates from it. So San Jose, uh, its uniqueness is that it overperforms somehow in terms of ideas and creativity by this metric. Um, so it is very important for a city, I think, to determine what this metric is for itself, meaning that if you ask metrics about Sao Paulo, you have to ask the question, how much of this is the Brazil as a culture, and how much is it Sao Paulo as a particular city in that system? So, so as I say, I don't know um, very much about Sao Paulo, and so what I'm going to say, I may be on dangerous ground, <laughs> but we hear that Sao Paulo has a lot of crime. Mm -hmm. is a lot of crime. Well, mm -hmm. the question is, does it have a lot of crime for the size of a city that it is? Um, one has to look across the, at the whole urban system of Brazil and ask, is it actually sadly overperforming on crime, and in particular on violent crime? Um, or is it actually, if you look at the number of violent crime, criminal um, acts and you look at the number of robberies, is it actually where it should be or not? So one needs to distinguish uh, what is the culture of Brazil, and I don't know, here I'm on dangerous ground because maybe Brazil, Brazil has, a more, <laughs> has more crime. I, I'm very dangerous. In the same way, by the way, that the United States culture, we like to shoot at each other, which is a very weird thing to do, but we like to carry <laughs> guns and we like to kill each other with guns. Very strange. But that's who we are. And you have to ask yourself, in a given city in the United States, um, do we have more murders by gun uh, shootings than we have uh, via, um, uh, you know, relative to the size of the city? So um, I think you have to, so what I, I'm trying to bring to it, and it was in answer to the question earlier, is that you know, we need all the traditional ways of looking at cities and thinking about cities from urban planning, urban geography, urban economics, from politics and so on. But we should also bring to it, um, as, a, as a complementary view, some of the ideas that are invoked in, in traditional science and in particular in physics and try to ask the question, to what extent, if any, can we create a science of cities and ask these questions in a scientific framework and put metrics to these things and then ask, where do they come from? They come from social networks, but what is happening in particular in a place like Sao Paulo? And then have a dialogue, a continuous evolving feedback mechanism dialogue between politicians, planners, and scientists involved in this. Mm -hmm. Mas, professor. Mas eu, eu ouvindo o senhor falar, eu confesso a minha dificuldade de transpor as coisas na, na dimensão que o senhor sugere. E eu me lembro de uma pequena história em que um Marco Polo, descrevendo uma cidade, uma, uma um ponte para o grande rei, ele descreve pedra por pedra. E o rei pergunta, qual pedra que sustenta a ponte? E o Polo diz... Não são as pedras que sustentam a ponte, mas as formas curvas que as pedras fazem que sustentam a ponte. Aí o rei fala, então por que, que eu não vou falar sobre as pedras? Ele fala assim, porque sem as pedras não existiria a ponte. Eu faço essa analogia, dada a minha dificuldade de fazer essa transposição, porque eu imagino, não sei se está correto, que deve haver uma simetria entre essas dimensões que o senhor coloca, científicas, matemáticas, é, biológicas, com uma simetria com as razões, digamos assim, das dimensões físicas, espaciais, geográficas, topográficas, 
que constituem uma cidade, está certo? É, que foram muitas vezes determinantes em vários casos das civilizações, da Mesopotâmia à Brasília. Essas condições determinaram a implantação de um assentamento urbano, está certo? E, salvo algum acordo meu, algum falta de entendimento do pouco que eu estudei, dos seus trabalhos, que eu acho brilhante, é, significa, se há um acordo, que essas dimensões são amplas, como a pedra da ponte, significa que podemos abdicar desse saber, negar esse saber, significa que ele não é tão importante no processo educacional de compreensão das cidades, ou uma pergunta final. Nessa tentativa que nós fazemos de tentar entender esse magnífico artefato humano que é chamamos de cidade, o desenho, desenho, o projeto urbano não tem o mesmo grau de significado quanto as análises econômicas, sociais, científicas, políticas ou matemáticas? Porque, em última instância, a cidade se conforma com uma forma, que não é só matemática. Well, I agree with you, of course. I mean, it, that's of course true that um, cities are, you know, in a certain sense, everything. I mean, they contain everything. And uh, one thing, uh, maybe it wasn't clear in what I was when I was trying to explain a little bit about the conceptual framework and the theory, is that uh, one of the great, one of the challenges that one has to deal with is in in understanding a city is the, um, uh, I'll say, the mathematics that um, is underlying social networks and the way social networks behave, um, and understand that in, in, and how that couples to, is related to, integrates with um, the infrastructural network. Because, um, so let me just say one tangential thing. There's, there is a mathematics of, called network theory. But this network theory, which is very important and plays a role in the work we do, but that network theory is somehow in virtual space up there. You know, it just says, I talk to you, you talk to him, and you have your family, and so on. But there's these diagrams and so on. And we use that kind of framework. But the challenge is, to recognize that each one of those nodes, each one of those people in the network lives on the ground, lives on the city, and that person not only has to live in a house and get electricity and be transported, he has to move and interact. Yes. So that's the challenge, and that's what we tried to do to understand in this, in this uh, theoretical framework. So, não há uma posso cortar não há uma dimensão é, digamos estética nas relações das pessoas com a cidade e que muitas vezes transcendem a dimensão puramente matemática ou científica as pessoas que caminham na rua da cidade de São Paulo têm uma percepção da cidade que não é puramente numérica ou de que eu estou numa cidade de 11 milhões de habitantes elas têm uma percepção estética da cidade sensível e que modifica a cidade também. Yes. E é imponderável. Uma pessoa que vive em Veneza yes. provavelmente ama mais a sua cidade do que uma pessoa que vive em uma cidade sob condições muito adversas. Né? Pela beleza da cidade. É uma dimensão também possível da existência humana. E eu acho que é por ela que nós nos aglomeramos nas cidades. Não é por outra razão. Eu não acho que nós nos aglomeramos na cidade pelas questões econômicas ou... Ou de, nós nos aglomeramos pelas relações. É a minha opinião. Ok. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, we cannot include in this theory the beauty of a city. And, of course, that's extremely important. Venice is a classic <laughs> example, needless to say. I happen to live in a city that's very beautiful and very unique. And so I appreciate that very much. And that certainly plays a role in, um, obviously, in attracting people to those places. But um, it's very poignant that uh, Venice has a very small population. And I live in a city that is considered one of the most beautiful cities in the United States, but has a very small population. Most people 
live in cities that are not considered so beautiful. So it does play an important role, and the soul of a city, the, the soul and spirit of a city is incredibly important, obviously. And that goes to this question that we had earlier um, about the, you know, the role of the mayor and the city elders and so on in creating and maybe that was the language I should have used, is their role is, in fact, in inspiring us, the citizens, uh, you know, to, to have a meaningful life and to create and so forth. So all of that I completely agree. But I would disagree with you, as I said, that that's, that is the beauty of a city is not the reason that we have cities. I think that cities... Probably. Eu acho que não. Ah. Eu me expressei mal. Não acho também que seja. Ah. Eu ah. acho que ela é fundamental no processo da vida da cidade. Oh, yes. yes, I, I couldn't agree. No, absolutely agree with you. Um, there's no question that, and and um, it's not always true, but there is a correlation between, you know, um, the architecture of a city and its success, and there is certainly a correlation with something that is, maybe I'll extend what you said, and that is the, the cultural soul of a city, the, you know, the, the kinds of museums, the orchestra, the, even the kinds of restaurants. This is critical. This is what a city is about. This is what gives us a, this, this feeling of loving a city in that way. And I'm sorry if I misunderstood you, uh, because it is different mm. than why we live in cities. I mean, it may attract you to a particular city, of course, because it's beautiful and so on. But the, for the vast majority of people, I would argue that, um, and for the evolution of cities from, you know, um, agricultural communities 10,000 years ago, um, is primarily, f almost certainly, I think, for economic reasons, and that is, the extraordinary discovery that we made, even when we were probably hunter-gatherers, that if you and I work together, we can do more than each one of us working individually. There's a kind of economy of scale. That is, that by being collective about things, working together, we can make more, do more, and uh, create uh, disposable energy, so disposable time. And that disposable time is what allows us to um, meditate, contemplate, and create ideas and beauty. I think the questions of affective also approximate the people of the city. Ciro, I will ask a license, Professor. I also need to call here a quick break. We will return shortly. 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 Estamos de volta com Roda Viva hoje com o físico britânico Geoffrey West. E nesse terceiro bloco, João Ita, por favor. Professor, eu entendi Sim. que, diferentemente das modelagens com que a gente trabalhava, a que o senhor propõe não é instrumental, ela é mais explicativa dos aspectos comuns de crescimento de cidades como São Paulo, Tóquio ou Londres, por exemplo. E a partir daí o senhor diz que esse modelo explica que se a gente dobra o tamanho da cidade, se economiza 50% de per capita em infraestrutura, o que é uma teoria dentro do urbanismo que vem desde o movimento moderno, que justamente é que quanto a gente adensa a cidade, a gente economiza nos custos de infraestrutura, o que me parece muito correto. O problema, me parece, é que os 25% da variável humana, eles têm um poder gigantesco porque eles são determinantes da maneira como se distribui essa, essa infraestrutura. Essa infraestrutura ela vai ser mais eficaz, mas ela é distribuída de maneira desigual. E isso no Brasil, nos países subdesenvolvidos, é muito marcante. Hum. Eu posso pegar uma pequena cidade aqui do interior de São Paulo ou a cidade de São é. Paulo, e em ambas vou ter a mesma problemática em que a infraestrutura é distribuída desigualmente, os pobres são mandados para longe, o modelo individual de transporte do automóvel é o que prepondera. 
Assim como se eu pegar São Paulo ou Paris ou Londres, eu vou ter diferenças que são justamente pelo fato de que o estado do bem-estar social, ao longo de décadas, distribuiu melhor essas infraestruturas. E mesmo dentro de uma cidade que nem São Paulo, em 2006, por exemplo, eu tive um bairro que nem Pinheiros, que é um bairro chique da cidade, teve três ou quatro homicídios no ano, mas um bairro da periferia, é, no campo, na zona sul da cidade, teve 300, praticamente um, por, um pouco menos de um por dia. Então, eu, o que eu queria saber é se, a partir dessa interpretação, é, essa sua é, resposta ou essa sua maneira de, de enxergar a cidade, a gente, ela teria, vamos dizer, instrumentos para poder influenciar nestes 25% de decisão humana porque me parece, às vezes, talvez ingênuo aqui no Brasil, é claro, a gente acreditar nessa ideia de que existe um pai da cidade, um prefeito que seja sempre hum. tomado pelas boas intenções do coletivo, que é um ponto que o senhor trabalha muito. Aqui no Brasil, me parece que muitas vezes a situação é invertida. Então eu queria saber se o modelo não fica um pouco impactado pela dura realidade de países que inverteram a lógica do que seria uma boa cidade. Good, yes, very interesting and obviously very important question. So uh, there's lots of pieces to that. So um, first, and, uh, and I should have maybe said it earlier in the discussion about the um, potential impact of administrations. Um, you know, the, um, well first, I need to correct, I think something you said, just a, a technical point, and that is, It's, it's about 10 to 20 percent, it's not 25 percent that you have to play with in this, but that's a, um, that's just a technical point. But um, the important thing um, which I did not talk about is deconstructing the city, and that's what you're talking about, that of course it's, it's not homogeneous, and the way we have been, at least I have been talking, is treating the city at this level of uh, being effectively homogeneous, because I'm talking about averages, the average for a city. And um, the, um, uh, the first departure from that was in answer uh, to mm -hmm. Sabina's question that, uh, you know, how does it deviate still as a whole from it? But there's another direction which you're pointing to, which is extremely important, and that is how do we deconstruct the city and down to neighborhoods and areas and so on and so forth. And um, one can start thinking in the same way about these and asking uh, similar kinds of questions. It's actually, unfortunately, much harder uh, from a science viewpoint because there isn't data. Getting data, people have simply not thought of, you know, of course, urban planners and um, urban geographers and uh, so forth do talk about that, obviously, but there aren't the measurements. There isn't the data there, unfortunately. So um, this is a critical point uh, that needs to be ultimately addressed. But uh, one of the projects that we're involved in, I'm not involved with, but a, a close colleague of mine uh, is involved in, and I should mention here, by the way, it, it, it is not, this is not my work. It is, I happen to have put the project together and, and uh, brought these young people together. And they're the ones that did all the real work, not me. And one of those people is uh, a man named Louis Betancourt, uh, and another one's a man named Jose Lobo. Uh, and uh, what they, uh, they, we have a new project funded, interestingly enough, by the Gates Foundation of Microsoft uh, to look at what is called informal communities, favelas, slums, and so on, uh, because um, it's incredibly difficult to get serious data on, on these communities. And these are um, primarily the ones they are involved in, are ones in Africa, in South, Af in South Africa, in Uganda, and so forth, uh, but also in India. So to understand you know, what, how do these communities really work? I mean, are they autonomous in some ways? How, much, how are they connected to the city? What are their metrics? And so forth. In order to understand that dynamic, and it's the dynamic relative to the city, and start to ask questions about um, um, do we, how do we try to mitigate the kinds of questions of poverty and health and so forth? 
And, uh, you know, we need much more of that. This is just, you know, beginning at the tip of an iceberg. And Brazil, uh, which has, I mean, Sao Paulo and Rio, of course, have famous favelas. And um, no doubt there's lots of work been done, obviously. But the great thing about this project, which is very important, was that it was initiated by the sub dwellers themselves. They started it, and they started collecting data on themselves because they felt they were being misrepresented and because when social scientists came in to find out, they either didn't want to deal with them or told them things that were not credible. So this was considered a very important project by the Gates Foundation because it was initiated internally, and that in those internal um, I, I was going to call them, they're not social scientists, but they're <coughs> it, it, internal people that live there are actually doing the surveys and have the trust of the community. So this has been going for only about a year or so, but uh, is already, uh, you know, being extreme, extremely interesting. And if you're interested afterwards, I can give you the website right. and so on. But, but it, it's, it's just a, a, a beginning <coughs> example of trying to deal with the problem you're bringing up, um, partial, partial of which is that the, <laughs> there's, extra, as you well know, extraordinarily strong local interests, powerful interests in a city. And, and I think that nevertheless, we should remember that despite that, there's still the average increases. Does, has it, it's amazing. I mean, I come from London. And if you read the descriptions of London in the 19th century, Dickensian times, they're worse than Sao Paulo, much worse than Sao Paulo. Uh, and, uh, you know, things changed. So there is hope. The one thing that warning about that, two things. One is, one of the things you learn by studying complex systems is that it is misleading to solve one problem at a time. To solve one. If you just try to solve the transport system or you try to solve the favela problem only and you don't realize that in fact these things are highly correlated and coupled, you're doomed to failure. So one of the problems that often is in the polit political side is that's the thinking, is that you don't have systemic, holistic, more global, big picture thinking. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a critical lesson that you get out of this kind of work and no doubt the work that you're involved in. Professor, I have a question that is, in some way, related to what you were talking about exactly now. The senhor uses the physics and the physics and the mathematics to try to explain or analyze a phenomenon of cities that normally is in the area of geography, sociology, anthropology. E o nosso conhecimento vem da escola, a gente aprende isso na escola, é o conhecimento em caixinhas, né? Isso é da sociologia, isso é da geografia, isso é da matemática. Eu queria saber, é, tem um pouco a ver com o que o senhor estava falando, como que os seus colegas cientistas veem essa relação que o senhor faz de colocar meio que tudo, é, todas as áreas meio juntas, muito multidisciplinar, e como que a, as pessoas podem entender isso? Porque eu, eu percebo que a gente não está preparado é, do ponto de vista da educação, para ter uma visão tão multidisciplinar. Eu posso acrescentar uma pergunta à sua? Uhum. Professor, a, a, a matemática, está bem próximo da questão dela, a matemática tem uma natureza controvertida. Ela foi descoberta ou ela foi inventada? Há quem diga que foi tanto descoberta como inventada. Como a base de das suas equações, a, são base matemática, uh, que reflexões o senhor fez sobre esse, esse impressionante poder preditivo da matemática? O mundo, digamos, nesse universo que o senhor trabalha, é um pouco pitagórico ou não? So there's two questions which are sort of related. It's okay. So let me address this one first, and then I will segue into okay. your answering that. So, um, well. Um, yes, of course, you bring up something that's of critical importance for the 21st century, frankly. Mm -hmm. And it's not cities, it's not just cities, but it's everything, actually. And that is that the kinds of challenges that we face in the 21st century, 
um, are problems that involve all of the sciences, but not only all of the sciences, all of culture, everything, involves everything. And we need to find mechanisms for bringing people together who can work collaboratively on this. And then, uh, and at the same time, as you suggest, um, to start stimulating our educational system to have uh, not just highly stovepipe disciplined kinds of um, uh, uh, visions of the way to attack knowledge, but to be feel that uh, one needs to bridge the gaps between them. So, you know, people about 25 years or so ago, a small group of extremely distinguished scientists, Nobel Prize winners, came to the same conclusion. And they felt, felt very strongly that there was something uh, amiss in, um, the, in the research academic community, both uh, education, but for them, more importantly, in the research, that all research was highly stovepiped. It was getting even more stovepiped, that every field was now divided up, and each person was a, an expert in this one area. And yet, they perceived that there were these big problems that were developing that required big answers. Mm -hmm. And they founded a place called the Santa Fe Institute precisely to do this. And uh, these were the major Nobel Prize winners of the 20th, 20th century, um, economists and physicists mostly. And uh, they founded the institute precisely to bring people together who would not work on one specific problem, but you would bring together anthropologists, archaeologists, social scientists, um, uh, biologists, biomedical people, physicists, mathematicians, all in one place that would interact with each other. So that's where I am, and that's what attracted me to move to such a place because I became very intrigued and interested by these kinds of problems. And out of that came the foundation of something called the science of complexity and complex adaptive systems, of which cities, of course, are a fantastic example. But all of life is such an example. But all of the problems we're facing are such examples. So we've played a very big role in promoting this idea and, uh, the, and, and <laughs> something that has not come up in the conversation so far, two things. I mean, one is this idea of complexity, mm -hmm. that these are very different than the traditional problems and the ways we've attacked them in the past. That's one idea. Uh, but, but the other is that um, we need somehow um, a bigger picture in order to attack the biggest problem that we have to face, and that is, is any of this actually sustainable? Mm -hmm. Is, uh, you know, we've created these extraordinary edifices of cities, we've created an extraordinary standard of quality of life for some of the people. Um, we have seven billion people on the planet. We're gonna have 50% um, more in the next 30 to 40 years, and we're growing cities at this exponential rate. We're growing them at a rate where there is an equivalent to Sao Paulo erected on this planet every two months. Every two months, there's the equivalent of that being, that number of people being urbanized on the planet if you average between now and 2050. That is extraordinary. The, the stress on resources, let alone the social fabric, are gonna be fantastic. And what it also means is that China which is building maybe 300 new cities of over a million each in the next 25 years. That's what it claims it's gonna do. What's happening in China is gonna affect Sao Paulo, is gonna affect Santa Fe, is gonna affect Paris, and so on. So we're all interconnected in this. So, and that's actually why I'm interested in cities. I'm interested in cities primarily because I want to understand and develop a, a framework for how do we address this issue that we're going at this exponential rate towards the edge of a cliff, and we may go over the edge, and is there some way of addressing it? I will need to interrupt him, I ask for excuses, because we will have to do a quick interval, and we will come back quickly to the last block of the interview with Jeffrey West.
de volta para o último bloco da entrevista com o físico britânico Geoffrey West, que veio ao Brasil para participar do projeto Fronteiras do Pensamento. É, no bloco anterior, eu tive que interrompê-lo, parece que o senhor já ia para a segunda parte da sua resposta à pergunta que o Ulisses havia feito. Just a, a, um, um minuto só. Uh, a minha questão é muito mais, digamos, de filosofia da ciência que de, que, de urbanismo. Hum, eu, yes. eu, eu, eu fiz essa pergunta porque yes. eu tenho a impressão que nós não temos o hábito aqui, digamos, de uma certa matematização, eu acho que aí não sou urbanista, mas a gente, talvez a gente tenha uma pequena uh, dificuldade, não temos o hábito disso. Mas me parece que esse, essa questão, essa natureza dupla da, ou tripla da matemática preditiva é... Eu imagino que talvez o senhor tenha especulado um pouco sobre esse poder preditivo da matemática e, na verdade, o meu interesse é que nós pudéssemos desfrutar da sua especulação filosófica quando o senhor elabora as equações físico-matemática para fazer o tratamento urbanístico. Sim, eu estou muito intrigado por essa pergunta. É algo que eu pensei muito. Qual é o papel da matemática no universo, por assim dizer? Porque uma das coisas que alguém poderia argumentar is that um, we have discovered in the last few hundred years since uh, Galileo and Newton that um, a significant part of the universe speaks the language of mathematics. And, uh, in, and, and one of the deep questions is, there are two deep questions. One is why? Why is it mathematics? Why isn't it what most people believe around the world, that it's Latin or Greek or Hebrew or Sanskrit or Arabic, that somehow they think that's the language of the universe. Mm -hmm. But actually we've discovered, if anything, it's mathematics. So the first question is, why is that? And the second question is, how far can that go? I mean, so, so much, much of our daily lives, we don't think of mathematics. And uh, we're not, even though those of us that partici participate in this extraordinary quality of life that we have, and even having something like this, mm -hmm. we would not have this if we didn't have a mathematics. If we had not developed mathematics and the scientific process, we would not have this and everything else like it. So it's had you know, for good or bad, it's had an extraordinary impact on us. And um, the, the question is, uh, not just why, but how far can you push that? So, um, can I really, can, do I really believe that you can understand love and hate and passion and why Brazil didn't win the World Cup with mathematics? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, no, almost certainly not. Um, but we could still have a kind of mathematical way of thinking. That doesn't mean that you couldn't have a mathematical way Same of thinking. Thing. And one of the things, going to the educational question that you asked earlier, which I think is very sad, is that very, very few people on the planet speak the language of mathematics. And I think it's a very sad comment that despite the fact that we all participate in it, without realizing it, that very few of us are educated in that language, which is, by the way, going to your question, a superbly beautiful language. Só, bom, são, são muitas perguntas né, que poderiam ser feitas, mas sendo bem direto, mãe, nós, nós viemos de uma, uma, um padrão civilizatório de crescimento urbano, né, de crescimento da população e assim por diante. Mas o século XX será o, o século XXI será o século, vamos dizer assim, da, da diminuição da curva demográfica, não é? ou seja, o momento em que as cidades vão parar de crescer. É? A população vai tendencialmente chegar a um topo, o Brasil deve chegar em 2040 e a população decrescer. É? Quer dizer, então, o crescimento populacional tem um limite. É? E é, quando as cidades chegarem num certo patamar de crescimento, de estabilização, é? Quais serão as fontes de aumento de ganho de produtividade das cidades? Esse é um ponto que eu queria lhe perguntar. E a partir daí, eu queria, talvez, voltando ao tema das favelas e da... Quer dizer, uma dessas vias não seria o tema da regularização, ou seja, da penetração das regras, da lei, da institucionalidade, dos serviços públicos, não é? 
da formalização das cidades versus as cidades informais, onde a esfera pública, de alguma maneira, não vigora, não regula as relações entre as pessoas, talvez não seja este um caminho vamos dizer assim, de ganhos de eficiência para as cidades após a estabilização do crescimento populacional? Yes, I, I, I mean, I agree with you with your last statement, basically. Yes, I mean, uh, so if we can get to this, I will use the word mythical place where we have stable configuration, where we effectively stop growing so that the, the population of the planet stops. We don't know if we will reach there, but uh, presumably there will be a time. Um, and therefore, Uh, the vast number of cities will stop growing, um, uh, then, of course, um, it becomes even more urgent to really tap into the extraordinary potential that exists in segments of communities and, in fact, the majority of the planet where we have this uh, mass of humanity who are living at uh, levels that are of either poverty Or, or very close to poverty, and um, presumably um, we will, hopefully, there will be sufficient visionary leadership to uh, tap into that potential, and that will be, a, hopefully, a source of innovation. My concern is that we're not going to get there, uh, that, unfortunately, um, we have not addressed the problem of exponential expansion of population and, more importantly, the exponential rate at which we are urbanizing um, soon enough and um, associated in this theoretical framework that I have tried to describe a little bit um, before is that um, one of its consequences is that, in terms of the network, is that the pace of life increases with the size of a city. The faster, the bigger the city, the pace of, the faster, the pace of life. So people walk faster, transactions take place faster, and so forth. And um, what this translates into is that um, if you want to continue open-ended growth, you have to be innovating, or at least continually reinventing yourself at a faster and faster rate. And um, it's not clear that we are able in this period between now, where we're on an exponential curve, and where we get to this point where we stabilize, that um, we have enough time to innovate fast enough to keep up with what is still exponential. So this is, this is a huge issue. And I stated it in terms of numbers earlier, Uh, pointing out that um, you know we're we're still urbanizing. We will be urbanizing in the next uh, 30, 40 years um, at a rate which is a Sao Paulo every two months, which is incredible. And as I said, uh, this uh, China, which alone is going to be building several hundred new cities, <laughs> will put an enormous stress and strain on resources. So there's these huge problems and. My concern is less that we won't be able, in some conceptual way, to understand and attack the problems, is that we need to recognize the problem. And my concern is that it goes to the questions about the politicians and leaders that e either at the local level in a city, or more importantly at a federal level, and even more importantly at the global level, there isn't even the recognition that we have this problem. There's a little teeny bit that we have global warming and it affects the environment and so on. But I don't think there's quite the realization that we have this potential for collapse. And I think we need to um, really come to terms with that and really start to think about how do we really ensure the long-term sustainability of the socioeconomic system, which has been so remarkably successful In, in, in the last 200 years. So uh, that's more of my concern than what happens when we reach, which would be a marvelous place, frankly, of a no growth. But, but by the way, it brings up, and I think that was implied in your question, this question which has not been answered uh, in economics, 
can we have the kind of vibrant, creative, innovative, wealth-producing kinds of societies that we've been producing in the last 200 years without growth? Professor, At the moment, it's all completely connected with growth. Professor, eu, eu queria aproveitar uma última questão em, em relação a isso que o senhor acaba de dizer. É, agora há pouco o senhor falou que é preciso ter esperança. Né? É, o senhor imagina que essa, essa sua teoria possa ser utilizada pelos gestores para fazer essa guinada nas cidades para que, de fato, elas se tornem mais sustentáveis, que elas se tornem equilibradas? É possível isso? Posso, posso eu enganchar uma rapidíssima <risos> complementar? Com o, tempo, o senhor tem uma visão generosa de que essas soluções vêm da própria cidade, das redes associativas. Hein? Como a marca da desigualdade é muito forte, aqui um geógrafo que nós tivemos, Milton Santos, já dizia é. que é na pobreza que surgem eventualmente as melhores soluções. As soluções que vêm de baixo, elas terão como furar esse bloqueio para se tornar, portanto, a pauta desses governantes? Porque, em última instância, é a busca da felicidade que se pretende na cidade. Essa busca da felicidade, seja como a gente possa interpretar isso, é essa esperança. Nós conseguiremos. Well, I can't answer that question. I don't know whether we will achieve it. Um, I, uh, you know, and happiness, of course, is an elusive quality. Um, what I hope is that what we can achieve for the citizens of the world is that each person can live a meaningful life and um, a meaningful, productive life and not be overburdened by just the sustenance of life, which is what is true of the majority of people on the planet, are simply burdened by living, um, and which is presumably how we were you know, before we became social creatures. So um, the question you asked is something that we uh, touched on earlier. Um, I would say that, um, you know, what I have been involved in with my colleagues, uh, and I mentioned Luis, Jose, Debbie, and all my wonderful young co-workers, is um, trying to develop a way of thinking about cities, which is a little bit different than things in the past, but to provide a framework that can be used in terms of um, dialogue and interaction with policy makers and practitioners and so on, so that we can understand, first of all, what the mechanisms are that create these problems, but also how they can be uh, mitigated by making adjustments of one way or the other. And, and one of the major questions is the one that was that Joao asked, which is, of course, this question that we touched on earlier, the extraordinary question of inequality. And, um, and, and a deep question about whether, you know, this is nothing to do necessarily with cities, um, can we have a society where we mitigate inequality and in particular um, have a meaningful, productive life for those living in favelas? Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there is in that, by the way, a presumption that these people don't have meaningful lives. And so, there's a whole other issue here, which is not to do with any of the theory I talk about, which is a general question, and that is, um, you know, we need to understand what it is about life that all of us want, and not to overly prejudge people in different kinds of cultures and different kinds of conditions. I mean, so that's just a warning piece, but in general, I would say it's true that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, what uh, the, the, the kind of idealized future would be one where we don't, we would mitigate growth, but we would still have enough churn in the system, enough buzz in our cities um, to create ideas and uh, to innovate, and so that all of our citizens, citizens can participate in you know the wonders of what we've created in the last 200 years with science and technology. Muito bem. Tomara que a gente chegue lá, professor. Agradeço muito a sua participação. Infelizmente, o nosso tempo acabou. Eu agradeço a presença do Ciro Pirondi, do Fernando Schuller, da Sabine Riguete, do João Sete Whittaker, do Ulisses Capozoli. E, claro, agradeço a você que nos acompanhou até agora, em especial ao Audio of West, que, apesar da agenda apertada, o Brasil 
conseguir um tempo, um espaço para acompanhar a gente aqui e nos dar essa entrevista. Uma boa noite, uma ótima semana a todos e até a próxima segunda.